Okay. Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome to our March 25th Finance and Administration Committee meeting. Uh, we will hold off on the minutes until we've got our quorum here, uh, but we will jump into our accountability audit exit conference. Danielle? Hello. You guys see me like once a year. Uh, I, I'm uh, Danielle Arnold. I'm the compliance tax auditor for the city of Spokane. Right now, I'm your internal audit department in its entirety. So uh, what I've been doing is we're working with SAO over the past five-ish months, something like that. We've gotten to the conclusion of our audit. Could you um, use the microphone? Yes, I'll stand closer. Um, <laughs> so they're here to um, give us the rundown of how the city went. And I believe everybody up here received the management letter comments, or at least the uh, finance committee chairs did. Um, so if you've got any questions specific to those, just let me know. Otherwise, they're going to do their song and dance for you. And hopefully, I can get the presentation to Jacoby if he can't find it. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Just waiting for the presentation to open. I guess I'll start off with introductions, if yeah, that's please. okay. Yeah, I'm Alicia Shaw. I'm the audit manager for Team Pullman, which is the local team here that audits the city of Spokane. Um, with me today, I have Larissa Nolte, who's an assistant audit manager on my team and supervised the audit this year. And then Andy Rood is the in-charge auditor uh, for the city's audit this year. So um, first, just want to thank you for the opportunity to meet with you and go over the audit results of the city's accountability audit for 2022. Um, Am I ready to just click through here? Okay. So we did we did provide an exit packet um, to council, and and in that are the high or the results of the audit, including a copy of the report that we'll publish on our website. Um, the presentation that we have on the screen just includes the overall high-level results of the audit. Um, feel free to ask questions. We will prompt at the end for any final questions that council may have regarding the audit. Um, but at, during the presentation, if something comes up, you're welcome to ask a question as well as we go through the areas that we reviewed this year. Um, as you know, the Washington State Auditor's Office, whoop, where do I point it? Sorry. Okay. Click down. Click down. I can advance for you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your participation in our presentation. <laughs> um, so as you know, an important role of the, of the audit process is to perform uh, independent, uh, transparent examinations of the city's financial operations during the year uh, 2022 that we covered and to report out on those results on our website. And that allows citizens to see uh, what the financial operations were for the year and the results of the audits for the areas that we examined. Um, you know, our role is really to help just increase trust in your government. And we do that through the independent transparent exam examinations that we perform annually for the city. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Andy Rood, and he's going to talk about the accountability areas that we looked at this year. And uh, so I'll let Andy take it away. All right. Thank you, Alicia. So for the city, we conducted an accountability audit for the one-year audit period of January 1, 2022 through December 31, 2022. And the results of the audit can be found on page five of the exit packet that we handed out. So just briefly, the purpose of an accountability audit is to determine whether the city complied with state laws, regulations, your contracts, your grant agreements, uh, your own policies and procedures. And in addition, they also review whether the city has adequate controls in place to safeguard public resources. Uh, in the areas we selected for audit, we are pleased to report that the city complied in all material respects with the applicable state laws, regulations, your own policies, uh, and provided adequate controls over safeguarding public resources. I do want to note that we did identify certain matters related to inf information technology user access uh, that we communicated to city management in a separate and confidential communication. You'll see a brief summary of the management letter is included on pages 10 and 11 of your packet. 
Um, however, to minimize IT security risk to the city, we will not be discussing the details of that management letter during this public meeting today. Um, I will note just briefly as well that for all management letters, there will be a reference to the letter in the published report, but the full body of the letter is not going to be included in the published report. Any questions about the results of the accountability audit? All right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so for the audit, we use a risk-based approach to select areas for further review that we believe have the greatest impact on the city. So we summarized the areas we reviewed on this slide and the next slide. Additionally, we provided a full list of the areas we reviewed in the audit report packet uh, found on page six. I'm gonna touch on some of the more unique areas we reviewed and then uh, I'll open it up for questions at the end. So. First off, for the Parks and Recreation Department, we conducted a full departmental review with specific focus on revenue collection, general uh, fund disbursements, as well as contract approvals. So for the revenue side of things, we reviewed how the Parks Department is tracking and um, customer accounts balances, how, you're, how they're billing for them, and how they're collecting revenues, as well as other cash receiving and deposits within the department. For expenditures, we also reviewed um, how disbursements are being approved by the department and whether that's being done in accordance with city policy. And then for contract approvals, we reviewed it, how those larger fund disbursements that require contracts are being approved, making sure that they're being done in, in accordance with the city's policies. Another one I'll touch on is for payroll. So for payroll, we looked at a couple areas that fall under that umbrella. So first we looked at overtime and special pay within the fire department and the police department. And really we just tested to ensure that the pay was allowable, that it's being charged correctly and in accordance with the collective bargaining agreements applicable to those departments. Additionally, we looked at gross wages and personal leave, uh, specifically related to how um, salary wage increases were approved and how personal leave is tracked and approved as well for city administration. And then just the last one I'll cover on this slide is about the contract compliance. And for this area, we looked at the the city's new AIMS citation management contract as well as the park mobile contracts for compliance uh, with state laws. And then can you go to the next slide? And then just the one area I'll cover on this one is related to cash receding. So we perform procedures over voids and adjustments that are processed by the licensing and permitting services at the city. And we tested to determine that those voids and adjustments were allowable and for a valid business purpose. So again, I'd like to reiterate that we determined that the city complied in all material respects with uh, the areas that we reviewed for audit. However, we did note those certain matters that we communicated to management in a separate confidential uh, management letter. Are there any questions about the areas we selected for audit? Anything I went over, anything I didn't go over? All right, I'll pass it on to Larissa to wrap this up. <coughs> So I just have some concluding remarks today. So um, audit costs are less than we had originally estimated in the engagement letter that we provided at the beginning of the audit by approximately $15,000. And this is primarily due to the strong um, collaboration that we had between the city and SAO during um, our initial planning phases and um, audit requests. Um, the next audit is tentatively scheduled to begin in May of 2024, and that will include our review of the city's um, federal programs are their single audit um, with the financial portion tentative, tentatively scheduled to start in June. Um, an estimate for the cost of this next audit has been provided in the exit packet and that can be found on page two. And next slide. Uh, we expect the city's report to be published on our website in the next one to two weeks. If you haven't already, you can sign up to receive email notifications of when our reports are released. And um, in addition, we also send an audit survey at the end of all of our audits when the report is released. So if you do receive a survey from us, we do um, appreciate any feedback that you can provide, good, bad, or indifferent. We always try to incorporate any feedback into our next audit. And then um, before we wrap up here, um, we just want to thank you for your time today as well as our audit liaison. We really want to thank Daniel um, Arnold and Scott Jordan for their assistance during our audit. We really appreciate their efforts and everyone's efforts in getting this audit um, wrapped up. Are there any questions for us as we conclude? Any final questions? No. No? Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very Thank much for the presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Uh, let's bounce back real quick and we'll do our meeting uh, minutes for February. Can I get a motion? Move approval of minutes. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, okay, and these should not take 10 minutes each, uh, barring questions. But uh, I've got a resolution and an ordinance that I'll present here real quick. Uh, the first one is a paper reduction resolution. And again, these should be in the packet, so I'll just do a quick overview. Um, essentially, and there was a version of this that I presented back in December, and um, uh, still looking to get some additional input from the administration on this. Uh, but kind of went through and just made it clearer, laid out a little bit more of a process and identified uh, 2027 as kind of the date by which we, we would like to be a paperless uh, city, understanding that there is a lot of moving pieces to making that possible. Um, and so this basically lays out that it would start as a voluntary reduction by council members and the mayor. Um, and then we'll be doing cost benefit analysis of uh, the work that we're doing on going paperless. Uh, and then we, we, we would then be looking to each city department to identify a plan as to how they would do that, what technology or what tools they would need, that sort of thing. And the same would go for the, the city council office uh, as well. Um, and then of course we would be collecting performance metrics to make sure that this is in fact saving us. The goal here is obviously to save uh, on the budgetary side um, and also just make us more efficient and effective uh, by having quick access to documentation. And so we'd be looking at performance metrics to make sure that those things are actually occurring. So uh, are there any comments, questions, thoughts on this? Yeah. Just because it's my age, <laughs> um, I still like paper. I'm willing to pay for my own. But my concern is uh, I think it's a great, but there's we've got to get some money at how we update these systems to sure. go paperless per department or citywide. I am. Some organizations, uh, every council member has a laptop of the yep. days and all that stuff. So I guess it would be the funding council member to help get us there through IT, what kind of feedback uh, they could give us on, on that part. So that's, fully, that's just my yeah. question. Full, fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have some examples of just other municipalities or agencies that have also gone paperless? I don't off the top of my head, but we, we have found a few others that have, I don't know if they've gone 100%, but, but they're working in that direction. So I can get you those, those cool. cities, though. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think last time we talked about this, I asked what is our current paper usage and how much does that cost? I don't know if you yes. were able to get that. I do not yet have that, but I know Matt has done some calculations on the cost savings, and he believes it'd be a pretty good substantial amount if we can get to a, a real reduction. Okay. All right, just to follow up on but that. we'll get the numbers. I'm not exactly sure what a 90% a reduction of individual paper usage really means in practice. I don't know what our current use is and what that okay. goal would be and how that would be implemented. So you want a baseline? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, we can do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I, I think it was more, they're more inside thoughts, but um, I, do, I do try to go yeah. Paperless, but the Wi-Fi is so bad in here. I have to make sure I do it a couple hours ahead of time and get it completely downloaded because this isn't a city device because we're not provided with these. Yes. Um, but it would be nice if we had better Wi-Fi in here. Um, I'm happy to buy my own iPad, but... <laughs> no, that, that definitely makes sense. I've had issues with that as well. Yes. Betsy, it's not your age. I like paper too, so <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> yeah, I Gonna yeah. Please. Follow up. How does this work for external facing um, communication and community outreach? If it's yep. paperless, does that mean we no longer? No. Nope. Obviously, there will have to be some exceptions for for folks that need something on paper. But as technology obviously evolves, I think that will be less and less of an issue. Um, but you're right. I mean, that's the stuff that each department will have to figure out if we were going to move down this down this path. My, my yeah. last comment, Councilmember McCackhart, is I'm in several large organizations that's gone paperless, or we have the technology, we have the technology, and we still have the paper. So there really hasn't been a divorce um, from that. So we, I think it's an aspirational it, goal. It is. But it's just... It, it's, it's absolutely aspirational, and I think it's also... But, it, you know, and it's... One, one example that was pointed out to me was uh, at our budget meeting last week or two weeks ago, uh, you know, we each had a full color, single sided, you know, copy of the presentation that was being given to us. And so can we just start to be more conscious of those things and re reduce some of that, you know, in this aspirational goal? So 
Uh, okay, anything else on this? Nope, okay. And we are, uh, I am definitely looking for more feedback from council members and the administration on that as well. Um, okay, the next, uh, this one is an ordinance. Uh, and this kind of stemmed from some of our conversation in our council retreat last month um, regarding emergency ordinances. And of course, this has been an issue uh, for those who've been up here for four years. It's kind of been an ongoing issue to a certain extent um, as to how frequently and, and when is it necessary to pass an ordinance as an emergency ordinance. So this ordinance um, that uh, I drafted with the help of, of Chris, giving us some feedback on it, it basically lays out the requirements for an or that an ordinance has to meet for it to be considered an emergency ordinance. Um, I'll, I'll read this one section here that I think kind of lays it out the best. Um, an emergency ordinance may be adopted only when the ordinance includes detailed findings regarding the following. A, there is evidence of an imminent threat that could result in significant harm to the public health, safety, or welfare of the citizens of Spokane. The situation is sudden, unexpected, and requires immediate action to prevent or mitigate the threat. The normal course of legislative procedures of the city council cannot timely address the threat without causing or exacerbating harm to the community. And a citizen's referendum delaying the effective date of the ordinance will be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare. And so essentially the requirement would be that in your um, uh, whereas clauses or throughout the, any sort of ordinance that has an emergency uh, criteria to it that we would be denoting how it meets those requirements. And so happy to take questions or comments. Uh, Kitty first and then. I, th I think um, this all makes sense except for in the case of opportunities that we might have just found out about. That's the only okay. concern I really have. If, if I don't know what the language would be, but if we could find something that, if a grant comes up really fast or the okay. expo thing sure. or things like that. On that, it's a non-budgetary ordinance. So things like that, you know, opportunities, financial opportunities that pop up would not be That's governed true. by this because it's a non-budgetary ordinance. Um, but I do, I love this ordinance. I've been hating on emergency ordinances for a while now. And I think this perfectly sums up exactly what needs to happen because, you know, when Council President Beggs was here, what's an emergency? An emergency is when I got five votes, right? And so the fact that we're not going to be doing that anymore is a really big deal. It was a massive violation of the spirit of the law. And uh, so trying to define what it is, because it was poorly defined before, giving it clear definition is going to be very good for the city of Spokane. Because when you say emergency and it's not something that's emergent or, you know, we would defer it for a month or whatever it is, by definition, that's not an emergency. So I really appreciate uh, Michael and uh, Chris, uh, you know, what you guys did on this because I, I think it's really well crafted. Um, I think it's going to give us very clear direction as a body of like, this is what an emergency is, this is what an emergency is not. While I think still giving us the flexibility when it comes to, uh, you know, budget issues or something like that as we're dealing with SBOs, completely outside of this right here, this is, I think, again, really thoughtful, really well crafted, and uh, I'm excited to see it go. Chris, is there anything you would add to the... Yes, um, I would say there's a minor typo, not a minor typo, but a um, in page two toward the bottom, uh, the language, the red line didn't translate very oh. well, but we intended, I think, in this version to say that it's going to take five votes and not a unanimous vote, correct? I just want to make sure that the right version goes forward to yeah. council. So um, it's going to be five votes. That way it matches the charter language on emergencies, and we don't have any issues about unanimous votes being inconsistent with the charter. And on that charter language, uh, you know, if in my opinion, there's not a single thing that we as a body should be able to do that can't be overturned by the public. And so I think this, again, helps to give uh, a pathway for the public if there's something that, that we're getting out of bounds on. Absolutely. Other, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering how, or if you could give examples of how you think this would be different than the current practice. In, in, for an emergency, you have to give findings. You have to give facts of findings that show this is 100% an emergency and here's how we're defining it and, and showing that it is an emergency, not something that can be pushed back. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. But it also, uh, it, this lays out exactly what you have to meet and it's, you know, so identifying that it's imminent, identifying that the normal course of process, uh, legislative process won't work, identifying that a referendum and delaying the um, effectiveness, uh, effective date of the ordinance 
would be harmful. I mean, I think identifying those things, laying that out in the findings, making that clear to the public why this is an emergency is kind of that key difference between today and, and if this were to pass. So just so I'm clear, um, I like what you're saying, yeah. but um, would this allow if we needed to, because I'm not sure if it, if it means no SBOs or, um, but what if we needed a match for a grant or we needed to jump on some kind of group regional activity or something that we're, yeah. this would allow that? Yes, I believe okay. it would because okay. it would not affect SBOs themselves. This only affects non-SBO emergency ordinances. Okay. Because all SBOs take five votes, and so this is all other votes, essentially. Okay, that's the only concern I had so yep. far. And if there's some tweaks and things that people have, please send them my way, and we'll look at those. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've also noticed this doesn't say anything about to carry out the operations of the city. So that seemed, I remember that coming up at retreat. That yes. You're no long, that, that's no longer allowable by this ordinance. That, that in itself does not, uh, does not indicate an emergency. You're right. Under this ordinance, you are correct. And the reason is that that could essentially be extrapolated to be almost anything you want it to be. And that was the, the reasoning for leaving that, that piece out in this. So I, I, a hypothetical in practice, then, if um, the city council had a, approved something that was to go into effect, but then wanted to change that quickly before it affects, that would not be allowable by this for the operations of the city. So say landlord tenant okay. regulations that they wanted to pause or change quickly before they were to go impact people, that would not. Without, have, without identifying how it meets this or, and, and then having the five votes, of course, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in that instance, yes. But I, but I even think there that there is um, some play. And I think back to when the, uh, um, uh, the Appraisers Association came to us after we approved a law. And they were like, you are going to absolutely shut down the housing market uh, in the city of Spokane with the law that you passed. That, that to me is sudden and unexpected. Those are things that we didn't know about as it came up. That does present you know, a, a danger to the community. So I think that those kinds of things are still, are still there. You just have to demonstrate how it, how it is that. I don't yeah. think it slows that down. Uh, at all. Okay. So, yeah. so that would meet a threat to the public health or safety? An appraiser not being able to do their job? Or I guess welfare? Maybe welfare. Yeah, the public welfare. Maybe. I, I guess another question I have is a lot of this seems open to interpretation still. Yeah. I don't okay. know how this is different than our current open to interpretation of what an emergency is. Right? Like what is an imminent threat? What is considered a welfare? What is sudden or not unexpected. Like, all of these are open to interpretation, so I guess. But you have to identify it in, right now you don't. You really don't. I mean, you can have some recitals, but you don't have to identify these specific issues. On, on the sudden or unexpected, didn't we define sudden or unexpected like it had to happen in so many days? We, we, um, kind of. No, we no. do have a, a, a piece in here. Let I me thought it was like four days or something like that. Or That's, that's when it comes to deferral. In other words, um, and whether or not your, yeah, your particular okay. ordinance oh, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. represents an emergency, if you've deferred it too much, then it isn't. Right, that's right. Yes. Yeah, then, then by default, if you've deferred it beyond four days, it would revert to a non-emergency ordinance. I mean, I guess I'm happy to go through and define sudden. I'm happy yeah. to define welfare. I'm happy to define all of those things. Because, uh, again, the idea is, is that the emergency ordinance was abused, and we all know it was abused. We all agree that it was abused. And uh, it, well, at least not on camera, I think we've, <laughs> we've agreed on that. And so uh, this kind of stuff right here, giving ourselves these guardrails, I think is very good because, again, the thing that we have lamented is that it was poorly defined, and so then we were able to do it way more than we should have been doing it. So giving it definition, uh, I think, is very good. And if it needs more definition, I mean, I'm happy to... To yeah. give more definition. Yeah, we can be, we can be clear, uh, certainly, in the ordinance. But I think, to me, the real reason for this and why we want these guardrails is because, at the end of the day, what we do when we pass an emergency ordinance is we tell the public, hey, you are not allowed to run a referendum. We know better than you, and you are not allowed to run a referendum. And so this just makes certain that what we are doing is an emergency so that when we are taking that right away from the citizenry, we're doing it for a very valid and good purpose. And that's, that to me is, 
95% of the reason for wanting these types of guardrails in place. I think um, this sets up a good framework to discuss it and justify what an emergency is. I think if we define it too clearly, though, it, I actually like it the way it is because then there's room for discussion. We can have some nuance because otherwise some weird unforeseen thing sure. may bite us. Um, but otherwise, I think, I, I think I'm fine with it. Yeah. yeah, I think I agree. I, we don't want to box ourselves in um, too much. There's some nimbleness, but I agree there has to be um, some guardrails. And um, and I guess I would be curious too, and uh, trying to understand past emergency ordinances, what has been um, sort of left in uh, statute, perhaps, because if folks are going to go out for a referendum, there's a threshold, there's yeah. ballots, you know, like trying to get something on the ballot by. November when this might have been a, a six month, you know, an inter emergency interim ordinance. Yeah. And so um, how that kind of uh, correlates. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wright, do you want to give us a breakdown of what last June was like for you and for how we went through uh, 15 different emergency ordinances as somebody was on their way out? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, the, but no, yeah. seriously, I, you know, without being too um, critical of any past practices, yes. I will say that the emergency clause was used as much to prevent a veto as it was to, um, uh, you know, get something in place quickly. Um, that was a strategic thought at times. That was my observation. Mm -hmm. So, Yes. Yeah, I was, I, I guess I was hearing one of the biggest differences that was that it, has to have detailed findings rather than recitals. I guess I just don't see how that's significantly different um, because we've had to have justification for why it's an emergency before. Now it's just moving it from recitals to findings. The other thing, I would be very curious if you could go okay. back and maybe put together a list of emergency ordinances for the last two, three years and okay. do analysis on that and see how many actually have been. Because, I, I, I mean, what it feels how many like... How you mean? Yeah, like historically how many... Emergency okay. ordinance have been passed, and how many of those are actually not an emergency, right? Because that's kind of the argument. Because um, it feels like this is just trying to kind of handicap um, some of the authority of a, of a majority of council members and trying to prevent them from being able to legislate. Okay. For the record, it's not handicapping a majority. It's, it would be handicapping a supermajority, right, but not a majority. And so it's not that we're taking the majority's voice away in any way, in my opinion. This, again, just gives clarity to what has been incredibly ambiguous, not just to us, but to the public that would come in and want to understand how is this an emergency? Define how this is an emergency. And we never had a good answer other than it is a political game, it is a political tool that we were using to prevent a veto, to prevent a referendum, or simply because we had five votes. This is good for us to give us guardrails. It's good for the public to help them understand what is and what is not an emergency. And it prevents the abuse, in my opinion, of the emergency ordinance in the way that it was absolutely abused at times in the past. So I'll just end with, it yep. really will come down to interpretation. You could find a definition of sudden or unexpected in Webster's Dictionary, but that gets us right back to what's a disruption. And so it really will be open to who is advancing what agenda at the time when it goes forward. So we did have a challenging year last year, um, and it was a lot of political posturing. I, I, I will agree with that. But going forward, because we brought this up in our own retreat, we we're trying to get our heads yeah. around what's an emergency, but we will never really have what is sudden and unexpected. That's clarity that maybe we can all agree on. So I certainly look forward to the information, yeah. Councilmember Cathcart, going forward and see what that brings about. Absolutely. And one last comment. And I would just say in an emergency situation, what I expect is not a 4-3 split or a 5-2 split. I expect an emergency. Those are probably, if it's an emergency, a true emergency, I expect that that's going to be a 7-0 vote. So Maybe a 6-1 to one on a case. Right. But yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, very good. Well, let's move along. We've still got a long agenda in front of us. Uh, Don Kinder, you're going to introduce our new director of CHHS.
Hello, Council. So um, Ariel is out of the region today, and with no Council meeting next week, we wanted to get on this week, but she will be here at the 3.30 session on April 8th to answer any questions personally and meet everyone. Um, but she's coming from the Spokane Housing Authority. She's been there for the last couple of years managing their lo very large housing um, What's the technical? Their housing choice voucher program for multiple counties. Um, she's really, really turned that department around and made the um, availability and access to vouchers much more streamlined. She also helped um, reopen their offices to the public when they had been closed for a while. Um, so very, very um, heavy into community access and community engagement. Prior to being at the housing authority, she was briefly at the Valley as their homeless outreach coordinator, and before that, spent several years at SNAP running their Singles Families Coordinated Entry Project. Um, she's currently the board chair of the Continuum of Care um, as well, and has been very active in that board for several years. So she's very well um, acquainted <coughs> with the providers, with the various fund streams that we operate within, very um, data-driven and compliance-driven, given her work at the Housing Authority, um, and also really well-versed in the public housing language, which I think will help us bridge better gaps between those services and what the city's putting out. So we're really looking forward um, to having her and her bandwidth on board, but she will be here on the 8th as well to answer any questions and meet you in person. Great. Any questions for Don? I can just say I work with her in the world of housing, Spokane Housing Ventures. We were both board members there so some years back, so do know of her and her work, and uh, she's very well respected. Yes, she does have great relationships with community providers and is, is well respected and understood. So, so is she coming from the Housing Authority or the Valley? The Housing Authority. Okay. She's at the Valley prior to that in what's now Eric Robeson's position. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay, cool. anything else for Don? No? Awesome. Thank great. you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mike Ormsby, <clears throat> SBO on Human Resources. Thank you, Council Member Beggs and uh, uh, members of the City Council and others present at okay, the you meeting. You just had a flashback. Yeah, you, you said just Council had Member Beggs. <laughs> hmm? Stand back. No. No, you said Council Member Beggs. Beggs. Oh. Not here. <laughs> <laughs> but talking welcome, too much about it. Back. Yeah. Well, you can tell how long it's been since <laughs> I've been right. here. So. That's right. <laughs> but it is good. It is good to be here. Um, in your packets, you should have the material supporting this request. <clears throat> I would be quick to add, though, that we happen to be here representing a number of other departments who helped put this package together, and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. Civil service has involvement in pulling this information together. Uh, budget and accounting has helped develop the financial figures and, and um, uh, have been very helpful. And then th there were employees internally in the department, um, some of whom are here today, which also helped to pull this information together. And it's led to, I think, some system clarifications that we will have going forward that I think the council will be happy to hear about. But um, first of all, I just wanted to identify that the general fund um, uh, impact is uh, minor compared to the total dollar amount. A number of these are general fund uh, departments, but they're internal service funds, so they, they will be paying their share. I think one of the process changes that has been implemented has primarily been done by the CFO and by uh, the finance department, and that is a specific identification and discussion with various department heads about the cost and impact that this will have on their department to make sure they understand that. And they did, but it, it's good to just make sure that that understanding continues going forward. So both um, civil service uh, and finance and HR will be talking more as we move forward about making sure that we're all on the same page because it's good to have a number of departments involved. It's also important to make sure each of us know what the other's doing and how that all comes together so that the decision making is clear and that accountability is clear. So uh, Matt Boston has been driving that bus and we're all uh, happily on board. So we'll continue to, to move forward and I and we're hoping to have these in a streamlined fashion going forward uh, on a quarterly basis so that uh, you have time uh, to look at and ask questions and, and we'll be available to respond to those. So if anyone has any particular questions about this packet or the process, I uh, would be happy to respond to them. Thank, Council thank President. You, Mike. So I just had, and I asked you earlier, it's kind of a mixed message. <clears throat> that departments are asking for these steps up in pay, two, three grade levels, 
when on the other hand, we're asking or talking about furloughs as we look at the financial situation of the city. So for me, it's like how that really all come together, I know it's not that great of an impact on the general fund, but the message is a little twisted right now as we're continuing to increase in compensation on one hand and then talk about uh, our budget crunch and furloughs on the other hand. So I just think we need a better understanding. As I look through the list, there were some like they were positions that had not been filled or they were just being filled. So they went from zero, like they're just coming on board. What, and so the right. justification around um, that from departments is like, okay, you've done without them for this long. Why are we here now and, and what's the logic behind it? So I'm sure that was all presented to you. Um, it, it was, and it was actually presented to the council too because a number of the departments that are civil <laughs> service request are, we're all included in the budget. And of course, civil service is a separate budget in the general fund, but they receive an allocation from the council. So all of these positions were funded in this year's budget. And so that's why it, it, it shows nothing being paid last year. There are newer positions. The department has been revamped and is hopefully set up to provide uh, better and more direct service. So th th that has all been covered. And department heads need to, when they make the case, lay out what they're doing, uh, changes in, in step increases have to be justified by a change in either the job description or minimum qualifications. And civil service, I, I, Kelsey's not here to speak to that. They don't approve every one of those requests that come in. And so the, the case has to be made to civil service to even look at that. And then HR looks at and, and does the salary surveys. So there's a fair amount of work that goes into this. We got to make, we internally have to make sure we're all understanding what has happened before it gets to us. And the final approval is going to be the CFO being in touch with department heads to make sure they understand the impact of this. Many of these positions have come about, uh, and even the ones that cost the general fund money are ones that it's not additional money to the general fund, it's internal salary savings. So I think probably what the big message is that these positions were looked at carefully, we need to articulate that, and that there are a number of changes requested that don't go through. And so we probably need to be more transparent in explaining that process because this, we are in a difficult time now, and so I think we need to be clear if we're talking about making changes why we're doing that. Thanks. Anything else, Kitty? In these thank you. In these discussions, um, have have the unions weighed in at all about this? I mean, it looks like we're in a situation where we're facing furloughs and also trying to create equity in the salaries, and so I just want to make sure that they've been engaged. Well actually engaged they know about it but it's not it's not a process where we go to the unions and ask them in advance do you agree with this uh, that's that that's really a process for civil service and hr to go through these will these are all shared with the union so they know uh, but in terms of discussing we're going to do this and here's why we're going to do it that's not been part of the process that we've had in the past they they'll know about them and all of these, as you've seen, we've identified the unions. Job descriptions, when they're developed, are sent to the unions in advance to provide comments on them. And so they're able to say, this makes sense or it doesn't make sense. So that process happens. But in terms of this increase uh, discussion, there, I will say there was not that I'm aware of a discussion with any of the bargaining groups. OK, thank okay. you. Anything else? OK, thank you so much. Great. Thank and, um, Again, I'm not clear on the new process. I just want to make sure, is it, is it acceptable for us to go ahead and upload this for the council agenda on the uh, 8th, I believe it is? Do we need sponsors? Do we have sponsors? We have two sponsors, okay. but I just wanted to make sure yeah, that the, it's okay with the committee that we upload it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Well, we'll get Council President Biggs to let you, get you that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to hear about that. <laughs> Uh, okay, we are moving on to ARPA. Big conversation. Uh, Michelle and Caleb. Yeah. 
It is my understanding that we are here today for you guys to convene as your working group on what you're planning on doing. We're not here to present anything in particular, nor speak to the projects. We're just here to answer questions should you have anything about them. Um, yeah, I mean, this was quite the debate in our agenda setting. I, for me, I mean, I would just like, just a basic, here's where things are, you know, with the, the work groups, and then council can discuss kind of more intimately on, on each of those items. So do you just want to start with uh, this project of citywide significance, and that's Bingle, Klitsy, and Dillon? Yeah. And then you guys can decide where you're going with that. Yeah. These monies are not encumbered. They are not under contract. They are a remaining amount out there. Okay. So I think it'd be helpful to hear what those discussions are because other council members haven't been at those meetings, so I don't know if council yeah. members want to speak to that. If anybody wants to summarize? I, I don't feel like we left completely clear. Okay. Um, Caleb, were you there? I don't think... Um, I think it was a little unclear whether we were going to be able to get West Central encumbered again because there's still, is that true? Well, this is project of citywide significance. This is for oh, these I... are, um, this isn't sub area planning. Oh. This is through, <laughs> these are permits through the planning department for projects that are, were awarded. When has that committee met, that work group? We did, we have met since January 1, yes. Any recollection of your? I don't. I don't remember this one meeting. Do you guys remember? Okay. Okay. I don't remember what the projects were. Well, they're not. It projects. was. It was just permits for like big housing projects. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so we were covering those permits to try and uh, spur some Save housing eyes. development. Yeah. yeah. And I assume the discussion, if if there was one, was on can we get these dollars out the door in time and et cetera. So. Yeah, and the, the trouble with this particular group of projects is that, and Terry Stripes, I think I saw her back here, and so if I'm wrong, she can correct me, but um, as they, um, after they were submitting their proposals, uh, construction costs obviously have, have uh, changed, and so projects, uh, uh, many projects across the city have slowed down, not necessarily because they don't want to move forward, but uh, because they haven't been able to secure the funding, and so for us to be able to get the money out the door by the time they're getting their project going could be difficult. Did I summarize that properly or close? <laughs> yeah. Well, just a little properly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apologize. Yeah. I didn't know this was on your agenda for today. So every dollar is obligated. Right. And those agreements end April 15th. So anything unspent at that time would be available. So, so I assume then there's been no discussion of, of doing something different with these dollars in particular. Okay. Not, not from us, because it's us three. Yeah, right? through the, from, from <coughs> the work group. We I haven't mean. met on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I had a follow-up question. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, Terry, this might be for you. Uh, after that April, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> after that April 15th, or I guess what dollar amount might potentially be unobligated or not spent by that April 15th time? Apologies again. I've been out for two weeks for a family emergency, so I don't have that number for you today, but I have asked Ryan to get it to me tomorrow. Okay. Uh, do we want to move on to the next one? Sure. So sub-area planning, and that was Wilkerson, Cathcart, and Klitsky. Yes. And so we, we met, was it last week or the week before, and we talked about uh, essentially the sub-area planning in Northeast is underway, um, and there was some discussion of can we reallocate the, the dollars from planning to implementation in uh, West Central? That was the predominant focus of the conversation, correct? My and, and also, why hasn't uh, sub-area planning been under contract for East Central? East Central, thank you, Since yes. there's been a conversation for two years. Yes. What's the deal? And so I don't know that we've gotten clarity on some of the questions of whether we can or, or how long that will take, if we can do it in time. It seemed to me that 
Spencer seemed um, optimistic about West Central, but um, we were waiting on WashDOT to move first on one of the pieces no, no, for East no, Central? That, and I think that was a misconception. It's okay. like we had committed to do the sub-area planning on East Fifth Avenue before WashDOT was even a player okay. in this. So I felt for us to be waiting on WashDOT or somebody else is pretty disingenuous to that neighborhood. And we need to go ahead and do the sub-area planning Regardless, if we wait for WashDOT, then WashDOT's driving the train in East Central when it should be our community driving the train. So can we get it under contract? Can we get the sub-area planning done and then be in the middle of that wheel instead of on the outside? Also, I know on West Central, it sounds like we would have to rewrite the scope of work for, for mm -hmm. West Central yep. because it doesn't really fall into sub-area planning. And we, I thought there was some agreement we'd be, we would entertain that. Yeah. Uh, and I know Spencer was going to give us some verbiage. And perhaps we could contract with the West Quadrant TIF. Yes, to do some other work yeah. on that. So really, that timing kind of landed in planning's department. We're still fully supportive, but we're waiting on them to give us a Clarity. definitive time and when they can get those RFPs out. So okay. that's that one. So that's where we're at there. Uh, so just a follow-up question for that yeah. then. For the work group, then, it, I guess you guys have talked about the most, then is there a desire to keep the full amount there? Is there? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. All right, so there's no recommendation to claw any dollar from that group back? Not until we get some additional clarity from, from planning. But, but yeah, we did not discuss clawing back. Okay, uh, EV stations? I think we made that recommendation along with the municipal justice building to claw all that back, right? That yeah. was the work group's recommendation? Yeah, and I think we signed a resolution or voted on we a resolution. We actually didn't on that. claw back the EV stations and one other small pot of money. Do you remember, Michelle, which one that was? So it was talked about in the last time we did the SBO and where we allocated funds for the police capital and the recruitment for the chiefs, but it never actually got pulled back in, in, in the SBO, so it's still still hanging out there. One other one, I think. Well, there's the unallocated portion down below, but. Yeah, I would recommend clawing both of those back. And I think the big one on the municipal building capital is that there's just no plan yet and probably unlikely to have a contract for something that's feasible by the end of the year. Not that there's not a need. I think we all recognize the need. Uh, I think after what, yeah. a year and a half, two years of trying to find something, nothing's feasibly worked out yet. Okay. Um, youth behavioral health? So that's uh, Zapone, Bingle, and Navarrete. Yeah, so that one I can speak to because we talked last week about that. Um, that none of, or only $300,000 has already been allocated, and that was for the CHAZ uh, school based health centers, which will be opening next month, so hopefully we'll get an invite to that. So that remains uh, $1,700, $1.7 million, not $1,700. Uh, and so we talked last week, we'd been operating under the, the idea from council that this should be directed more towards activities and um, working with, we had all reached out to different community stakeholder groups to try to see what potential partnerships could come from activities. And last Friday, we met and talked about a proposal that is a joint partnership with the school district, Launch Northwest, and then the city would be a third partner on that. The city's part would be to fund, I think we landed on seven. Does that sound right? Seven and a half? I think it was seven. S seven um, navigators who would be based in um, community or cultural centers, I think is the, the operative word that we've been using, so kind of our network of community-based organizations. That's probably the best one. It would be based in a community-based organization, and their job would be to, uh, they would have money for funding, but also activities that they can host either at their community-based organization or at the school. The school district's gonna make their space available uh, for community-based organizations <laughs> to do more activities there. Um, and they would have uh, also funding for one-time purchases, uh, discretionary. Uh, mostly talking about probably vehicles as a big thing, so some vans that they can transport um, youth around in. So that would be the city part of it. The other partnership, the school district, has uh, is dedicating some of their own funding to create uh, activities coordinators in each of the high school feeder patterns. 
and they would be working on um, tracking down students who are not involved in any activities or clubs, finding the barriers, going to their houses to get the parents to sign the paperwork, helping them with transportation. So it'd be kind of that case management to try to get kids into activities. Launch Northwest, oh, the school district's also using funding to partner with other community organizations. So uh, like Hoopfest runs, um, or Hooptown runs the uh, elementary school basketball program. The like, Bloomsday being a partner for a uh, running club in the spring. Uh, Northwest Qualifier being a volleyball club that they could be organizing with. So they're trying to find other community partners to help run more or activities that way. And then Launch Northwest, it would be uh, funding uh, two, I believe is the number that they said, two of the community-based organization um, navigators. And also they'd be funding zero to five coaches that would have a connection with the hospitals. So after uh, a kid is born, the OBGYN would give the parents information about joining that school district feeder pattern with community resources, being out and present at all the community events, trying to offer parenting lessons, classes, resources for early childhood education, child care. Um, and then the key thing about the partnership is that the, uh, the, f the feeder pattern school districts, so all the middle elementary and high school principals, the zero to five birth coaches, and the uh, community-based organization navigators would meet monthly as a group cohort to talk about all the kids in the feeder pattern. And the school districts made a commitment to that and launch us to, uh, to track. They're going to use some software for tracking which kids are in activities and not. And so really trying to hone in on getting every kid every day into an activity. So that's kind of the, where we landed as a recommendation. Questions? Thank you, Council Member Zappone, for that really big overview. Uh, I'm not totally on board because all those systems you just identified should be doing that work anyway, whether we additionally fund them, whether it's the school district or Launch Northwest or what the city could be doing um, to, to partner with these organizations. So. And it is one-time money. Remember, it's one-time money. So I didn't hear anything, or maybe you'll come later with some type of sustainability proposal because it'll happen one time. We buy the vans one time, and what do we do with the equipment after that? So concept's interesting. It's just a little too vague of, of sustainability for that program, So, uh, but open to more discussions about it. Yeah, I'm also not supportive of this um, proposal at this time um, for, for a number of reasons Council President uh, just enumerated. Anything else? So I, I can speak to yep. that. So on um, the, uh, we've talked to them very frankly, said like, well, you all have funding already. Like you have funding sources. Uh, why aren't you paying for it? And it's be, their package, so launch, right? We funded launch with ARPA money already. Um, they're working with their leadership team on that. Uh, I wasn't at the last meeting, but they don't have the funding to fund all the cultural center community-based organization navigators. So the school district would move forward with their planning on this. Also, Launch would be moving forward with their birth to, fi to five um, coaches. But the key component here is our kids who aren't already serviced by those groups. And those, the school district and launch don't have the funding to do that. Their, their package of funding, it, 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 they just don't have it to reach out to the cultural centers. So if, if we don't partner, then they will move forward. Uh, but I don't believe it will be as impactful. And those kids that will be left out are the kids who are most likely to be you know, involved in a community-based organization network. And so it's really trying to get those kids resources and creating and expanding their programs there um, who are often left out of the normal programming at the schools. On the sustainability front, full recognition and this funding would go, so this funding would not go to launch or to the school district. It would go directly to the community-based organizations. And we have talked about that. It has to explicitly say that this is a two-year pilot program. There is no continued funding for this. Um, launch in the school district believes that they're going to have a successful model, that they're going to have a lot of data to back it up. They've already been talking to foundations about potential future funding on this. 
uh, that they'll be very competitive for future funding, state grants on after school activities. They're hopeful that they'll even, this, this model will be really groundbreaking with the use of data and tracking that they'll be able to get some national attention to on this. So they're really you know, optimistic, but I think it's a really big opportunity and especially for youth in our community. Uh, we know that kids who are not in programs from three o'clock to seven o'clock are more likely to get criminal justice involved, more likely to cause problems in our community. So that creates the school to prison pipeline. It helps, uh, this, this improves public safety and improves their, their mental health, their behavior health, um, while doing it on a large scale. This isn't about just focusing on like 10 kids, but this is focusing on the whole city wide, uh, lots of community groups, lots of organizations that are really focused on it. So that's fine. So I'll just, uh, I, I am also kind of skeptical uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, and I know you said the money doesn't go directly to launch in the school district, but it's kind of like we're, we're giving another portion of funding to two organizations that we've funded to some extent already. Um, and doing good work, but still, nonetheless, you know, there's other organizations out there. But really, for me, I think the, the biggest issue is it seems like we're funding a whole lot of bureaucracy and a, not much in the way of actual activities for kids uh, with all the navigators and all of this stuff. I would rather just put the money directly into supports for the kids uh, and, and just making this up off the top of my head, but it seems like we could create something with the Sports Commission that'd be some sort of a grant or a, a scholarship type fund to pay for kids who want to join SYSA or do CrossFit or gymnastics or, or lacrosse or whatever the, it might be, and they can go to them, get a grant to, to be able to pay for that, get shoes, get gear, whatever it is they need. So that would just be the way I would go about it um, off the top of my head, but. Well, I, I, can I address that? Yeah. Because I, maybe I didn't describe it. The operations would be over $25,000 a year per organization for seven organizations to, to do that programming and an individual who would help put on that programming too. So this is a lot, our funding from the city side would be for programming. It would not be for just bureaucracy and overhead. But for, the, okay. it would be one monthly meeting as a collaborative meeting and then they would be also working in their community to do that outreach and recruit kids and expand their programming. Um, and so we say like one, it was $75,000 for salaries and wages. So if they wanted to split that over multiple people, however they wanted to do that, hiring coaches to put on free clinics or whatever. Um, okay. I think the concern was, because we had talked about scholarships, we've talked about that with the Parks Department. The concern there was that that would only be two years of grants or two years of grants and the, or scholarships and then there wouldn't really be an opportunity to apply for future grants for that. This, I think, created an opportunity to expand programming while set creating a program that could be eligible for ongoing competitive programs, whereas other scholarships would just be done after two years. Okay. Anything else? So, yeah. I'm not sure where I'm at on this, but I do have two thoughts. Um, one is that I do know that nonprofits that are just starting up or new programs that are just starting up do need incubation funds. It is hard to go for more established grants when you're not in an already established program. So sometimes giving a program a leg up for a couple of years is impactful. The other thing um, I need to say is that when we just run a scholarship fund or put money into existing programs where um, people that are already engaged can take opportunities to get those scholarships, it does help kids that have engaged and aware parents or um, guardians, but um, one place where we really struggle is getting kids involved whose parents or guardians are not engaged in the community. So I'm hopeful that this program would do more to penetrate into those places where kids don't have great access because of lack of uh, mentoring from people in their community. So I'm hoping that this would provide some of that. Uh, let's move along to neighborhood business districts. Okay, that's Bingle, Dylan, and Zapone. So I speak to the, at the beginning of the month, so if we remember this one, it's gone through multiple iterations over time of uh, ideas of what the 2.5 million could be used for. Um, we did a round of town halls last summer uh, with different communities in each district to talk to the neighborhood business districts about their needs. Um, without clear direction from those town halls and not having the capacity as council or as administration to do more outreach. So where we settled uh, around Christmas time was to get a consultant 
um, to do that outreach. And that consultant, I believe, has been meeting and is uh, supposed to have a report to us by the end of the month Correct. Uh, about how they recommend allocating that $2.5 million. So that's where that one is currently at. I don't think we've re received the report yet or no, should be soon. Not as of today, no. Great. And we did get a brief uh, presentation from that consultant at our uh, last Northeast Public Development Authority meeting. So, uh, okay, any other questions on this one? Okay, moving on to multicultural centers. Okay, and again, that's uh, Bingle, Dylan, and Sapon. And this one has gone through over a year of outreach to different community-based organizations to try to hear what type of need they have and, uh, and, and what they would want. We talked about, is it better to create one center that's shared use that seemed to be rejected by a lot of groups uh, that thought that would be not very practicable and, and way of operating. Um, and then we, I'm sure we've all had experiences of different community-based organizations coming and saying, please create a center for us like you have for other organizations. And we saying, well, a million dollars won't be able to do that for everyone. So uh, the, we talked quite a bit to Empire Health Foundation and um, they are giving out grants to um, what they, technical assistance grants, I believe is what they're calling it, to help uh, these community-based organizations with their structure and funding and board operations and capacity building. And um, their recommendation, along with hearing from a lot of these community organizations, is they just really need help with their capital plans. And they're all at different phases of, their, of a capital plan. And so the recommendation is uh, an RFP to go out that would be uh, 10 $100,000 um, grants that could be paid for previous work that you've done in a capital plan so that you can reuse those funds for whatever your need is or on a future plan or purchasing of land or something where you can have it spent um, within a year, I guess. I guess we didn't say an exact date. Well, it has to be spent down by 2026. So it has to be spent, but really prioritizing those who have already got a camp capital plan in the works uh, and back paying them for that work. And so uh, that's the recommendation for, from the work group on this. Um, and I believe that it's ready to go out to an RFP soon if council is good with that one still moving forward. Any thoughts, questions? I, I continue to have concerns over funding uh, nonprofits, fundraising efforts uh, in general, but that's, that's just kind of where I'm at on that. Um, I don't know if there's some other pieces to that that makes that more clear, but it just seems like we're funding their fundraising efforts. Okay. Next up, uh, oh, is that it? That's it. There's just a more. little bit of okay. unallocated. Okay. What's that number total if we decided to claw everything back? Uh, with what you just talked about, yeah. clawing back? I don't have a calculator. 9.4, it's 9. the number at the Everything bottom. Everything on this page is 9.44 million. Okay. So eight, seven, seven, it's probably about five million or so, maybe six. You're for sure on the EV stations and the municipal court building and then there's the little portion of an unall unallocated. I'll get you that total. Great. Uh, is there just further discussion overall ARPA from the council? We still have a little bit of time. Uh, yeah, well, first for Michelle and Caleb, I, could you go back to the previous slide? And then we have a timeline for council on the proposed from the ARPA work group on a proposal of, of how to move forward. Um, I was just wondering if I had a question on this. I don't know if others have questions on this. These, this slide is the active projects that are already mm -hmm. contracted and stuff. Um, so if anyone has questions on about where those are at, I had a question on the homeless operations one. Mm because that's still an amount that is... Number two. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm not remaining to contract of 3.5 million. I can't remember what that meant. It just means that there's 3.5 million that hasn't been assigned to a contract at the moment, but they know that it's all spoken for and will probably be spent by the end of this year. I don't, I don't know what the new numbers are since they're scaling back on track and where that all falls in but this is all part of that. Was this originally mostly going to pay for track through the end of the year? I believe so, yes. And so now it's just a question of how much won't go towards track, basically? I think so. Oh, I was trying to remember what that one was. 
And then, um, Michelle, I think you had mentioned before that the ADU permits um, isn't going out as quickly as we had anticipated originally. It kind of got a slow start because they had issues with how and how to actually what documentation to give me in order to process the permits. I would have to defer to the planning department to know how far they are, or if they have anything in the future that they look like they think they're going to spend. Um, I have not been in touch with her. So that's really kind of a challenge for us. Some of these things that are internal in other departments, we don't know yet. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to be a little more concrete as to what's actually clawbackable. Mm -hmm. yeah, can we get clarity on our internal spend down? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the fire capital, that will be spent down. I mean, it's only $208,000 and where fire is always in need of capital. They just haven't placed any orders yet. Uh, then there's the ADU permits. The administration is to cover Caleb and um, Michaela's time working on the grants. Um, the park amenities, that is all in retainage. So there, it's, under, it's all retainage payments. And actually, I'm, I apologize. They've spent all of that. That 17 is left for playground equipment, but they will, I know they will spend that by the end of this year. Um, the 21598 for the fire safety house, that's for commissioning costs. So as soon as Fleet commissions the whole firehouse, then they'll enter fund bill and that'll get spent. Um, the language access, that was just new. Yeah. Um, we are, haven't gotten any movement on that. We are meeting tomorrow. Um, we're looking at um, trying to contract some services out for um, translation. Uh, Expo, new. Uh, we don't have any ground on that. The contract hasn't even been approved yet. Um, and then the 125 for, tree, for chief recruitment, 42 of that is under contract now, along with another, I can't remember, 21, I think is what the second contract was. Now, I know Launch is working overtime to uh, make sure they can get as much uh, spent, but do we know kind of where that's looking, just from your perspective? I don't have an answer. They okay. have not turned in their January and February draw. I did have an email com uh, correspondence with Ben Small this morning that he's going to try and get that to us as soon as possible and I told them that they need to stay timely. Okay. Um, and then the community center to capital, they have uh, the assessments done. They've got a line of work. Um, Jeff Till and Facilities is looking to put out a bid, a bid project for West Central and then um, for MLK, it's all going towards their HVAC. Right. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Not going to put you on the spot here, but I think another point uh, that would be really good to get clarity on is the news release that we saw yesterday um, from Mayor Brown. That was uh, news to a lot of us about the um, kind of strategic investments and what that looked like with the 9.4 million, what the timeline is on that, um, the plan, and how that correlates with our own priorities that we've spent a lot of time uh, laying out today. And I have a, a question on fire and police capital. I know we had done, did a little switch around police cars, but I wasn't clear where the fire capital's at, if we're going to actually be able to spend that money and the police capital in the window of time that's allotted. So the 3.1 billion that just went through, those, those vehicles have been ordered. Okay. They'll be here, the money will go out the door. The fire capital, this 208,000, they had, they bought three apparatuses, um, fire truck or fire trucks. Yeah. And this is just some left over, but they'll use it for commissioning costs. Okay. So we've actually paid for the fire trucks. Yes. Okay. We've paid 3.4 million. Okay. All right. And then I think the last part's the timeline and maybe we need to adjust this timeline based on feedback from today, but. Uh, the proposal is that today, Finance Committee, we hear reports from HCM to, um, about what the work groups have talked about and if they had recommendations on sweetbacks. The idea was that this Thursday we would have a dot exercise on reports from each of those groups. Um, for those council members who didn't participate before, dot exercise is just essentially whether you favor climbing back or not and then you're putting weights on them. Um, and trying to find support because we can't take a formal vote. It's an informal 
showing support, and then the ARPA work group meets to weigh those recommendations, I guess. Um, so that's just for clawbacks. The, the intent was then that would give us a month to talk about how we would reallocate the clawback. So if we came up with a number by the end of this month about how much we were clawing back, then um, in April, finance, the mayor would present her proposal for funding reallocation. So that was our previous plan before we got a press release with more information. Um, then we'd have a special meeting April 29th. There is no committee that day because there's uh, extra weeks for the month of April. And so we were proposing that as a special meeting just to talk about ARPA, probably shorter, where we could do a dot exercise for reallocation. What are people's priorities for reallocation? Then at June 3rd, uh, there'd be a final opportunity for an, an SBO reallocating, though that seems a little late. I thought that's, that the, that's the the final last day can be voted on. Yeah. So we were hoping to vote on an SBO following the April 29th. So having a vote in May for an SBO of a final allocation. Um, and then this is the part that uh, we've learned a lot from uh, the team here about how long it takes to actually get dollars out the door. And what we learned was that it, uh, the NOFA process has to start drop dead date July, and that's fast tracking. So really a priority of starting before that July 15th. Uh, for anything that has to go out with a NOFA, it takes them about a month to shape it, a month to figure out the details of what council wants, a month to actually put it in the computer process, a month for it to go out to the public to respond to, a month for scoring and contracting. So in order to have it voted on at the December 9th legislative session, it really needs to be dropped and started by July 15th. We also learned that that's similar for the procurement process for anything in the city, so like police vehicles. Um, if there's a desire to reinvest in police vehicles or other things that the city has to contract for, it will take about four months to contract it. So we've been talking a lot about what's our, what's our backups if some of these RFPs come back oh, without someone applying to 100% of the funds. So say there's a million dollars allocated for one and it's only 900,000 that gets a response. What do we do for the last 100,000? We won't. We basically don't have time at this point to do another RFP or even procurement um, by the time that those RFPs would come out. Multicultural centers, we may know that one by the responses. If, if that one were to move forward, we may know that in a couple months from now. Correct. So that one we could probably tie in if looking at the responses to know, uh, but other ones we wouldn't have time. The so we were talking about what's our backup options about if, if procurements of police vehicles, if there's a question too, if uh, we, we allocated funding two years ago to police vehicles and they haven't been delivered. So if they're not delivered by the two year mark at December, two years from now, that money would have to go back to the feds too if it's not delivered. So we're trying to figure out what are our backup options and basically I, you all were going to look into more options because we hadn't really prepared it. But so far the discussion has been on unallocated overtime. So if any budgets are overtime within the city, we could dedicate it to that. But it has to be un, sorry, unbudgeted overtime. And then the other thing is sole source providers and saying who's a sole source provider that the city can directly contract with and not go out to an RFP. So those are kind of our backups to make sure that all this money stays local. I, I think one of the backup plans is that would be revenue replacement. Uh, that is There's, one plan. It, it, can't, it can't go to the reserves. Not reserves, but revenue replacement. So we need to talk about that a little bit more because I think on the press release, um, the mayor is looking at unallocated monies, which would be revenue replacement uh, to be allocated as uh, some of the plans that she has going forward. Some of it has to go out to RFP, but that's where those buckets would land, so. So that. the revenue replacement just gives us the flexibility of how to spend it, so which mm -hmm. category, so right. And we've talked about how we have a lot of capacity for revenue replacement, so a lot of the remaining ARPA money is pretty flexible. But it doesn't change if it has to go to RFP. Revenue replacement doesn't change that, mm -hmm. so. Michelle wants, Michelle's biting her tongue. <laughs> <laughs> the term revenue replacement is, was calculated on how much revenue the city lost right. over the COVID. And it's been calculated at the end of every year for the last three years. 
and that is a category of spending that is a little bit less restrictive than all the other categories. Does it have to go out to RFP? Yes, it does. It yeah. has to follow all CFR 200, even if it's replacement. So then it still needs the same timeline. Correct. So if okay. it's revenue replacement, it still has to have an SBO by May to be able to contract by the end of the year. Correct. But I think we're in question. The issues that I have with all of this personally is that there's no direct plan on how to get out to RFP and what we're going out for. And that's where we're butting up against a timeline, and then I don't have the proper resources to actually execute. And so hearing some, from the conversation today, it sounded like there was still a few groups that don't have that specifics, but we were recommending not going back out. So if we look back to the timeline, like we have to have an SBO by the end of the month. Of, or sorry, by, by May, June 3rd. I guess, is the absolute drop dead latest. That so, is the latest. So let me. So let we're me, really wanting to do it in the May Finance Committee. Well, let, let me ask this. So the mayor's uh, proposal that came out yesterday, it, it includes some dollars for named organizations. How, how do you do that without an RFP? I'm just trying to understand that. You will have to go out to RFP. We will have to go out to RFP for those services to contract with somebody, but the funding is provided not is, but it. You sure. can defer to Mr. Jones if you want to. Yes, thank you. I'd like to refer to Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but in other words, though, if, if that does have to be go out to an RFP, then essentially council has to redirect those dollars by the end of April and have that RFP go out all, all in that time frame, right? No, it can follow this timeline for the RFP. It can follow the timeline for the RFP, but... The difference being is that we have a, a solid definition of what we're going after, and we can get ahead of it. Right. Instead of trying to develop a program that hasn't ever been done. I, I hear what you're saying, yeah. Garrett, do you have anything to add? No, unless, no. unless I didn't here. answer the question. <laughs> no, you did. I think some of that, too, this would be a good discussion for public safety in yeah. April, too, on some of the priorities and how this aligns with us, too. So For sure. Making a mental note here. So, put that on the next agenda. I guess I have a question, and maybe this is a different discussion than what we're having, but how can we say that we're going to give organizations money for this? So, like, we're going to give Catholic Charities $5 million. I'm confused as to how we can say that and still say it's going out to RFP and it's going to be a competitive process. Michelle, let me answer that for you. I think you need the mayor to answer that question. Michelle's grants, she'll do mm -hmm. what she's been directed sure. to do. But really, I think that's up to the administration really to address that, Councilmember Bingle. So, oh. Well, I was just going to say, just to add, I, I mean, all the mayor was trying to do as I think, I can't remember what month it is when we were all sitting up here, just to throw those ideas as soon as possible out uh, for consideration. Now, of course, whatever the procurement requirements are, I mean, we have to follow those. Um, but I think that was the idea to get those out before the DOT exercise um, to have those proposals in front of the council um, because I wasn't aware until this morning of the, the April 22nd date for those formal proposals to be uh, released from the mayor. But that was the intent to get those ideas out first and then in whatever it takes then for the procurement side doing the RFP, whatever it takes, that we just have those conversations as soon as possible. So timeline-wise, I think there's a question if we're ready to have a clawback discussion by Thursday. It sounded like a few groups needed more time to meet. Is that sound accurate? Terry, do you think that we would even have numbers for the next... The do I mean, need, it's Thursday. Yeah. Do we need to push it back a week to try to give everyone a week, or I guess two weeks, because we're not meeting next week for the... I feel like we needed to get that dot exercise done, that initial one. Yeah. All, of the con all of the projects that are in the pipeline for projects of citywide significance, that money is committed until okay. April 15th. Okay. Regardless of what my numbers tomorrow are. Yeah, so we won't find out unless it's April 15th, right? 
Okay, that's really hard. So, you're, Terry, your numbers tomorrow will be based on applications that are in hand, and we're just it, we just don't know what is still to come in. It'll be every permit that's been paid to date. Okay. And they have until April fifteenth to spend down all of it. Okay. And then the last one is planning. We need them to absolutely confirm that they can commit all of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to add some to the projects of citywide significance. So we have funds identified in DSC that can backfill that amount. So we're not issuing new uh, projects of citywide significance at this point. I believe that we can come up with a number um, that we're going to go by, but we have funds to backfill that because that program is still viable. It was still approved. It's the, the only problem with it is the timing that you guys talked about earlier. We had an economic issue, and we still do. We have lending issues, and so some of these projects were delayed. They're still good projects that met the guidelines of the program, and we still want to see those projects happen. We have a different funding source, though, because ARPA, it is too risky to use the ARPA dollars for those projects. And you, you think then that we may have 1 to 1.2 remaining in that bucket then? This was as of your most recent information that you... Yeah. I issued a sixty five. Issued a sixty-five thousand dollar permit that changed the money from the previous slides that I'd given you. Okay. So if we clawed that back, those projects would still get funded. That's what you're Correct. saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good to know. And, Other. And now that I think about it, I think that's why we didn't meet as a group or anything was because we knew that those were still going to get uh, funded, and so we we had discussed about clawing those back. Yeah, yeah. that sounds familiar. Yeah. So, I guess I'm. Not sure. I guess I'd look to the council members. Like, is that a recommendation then on that funds from you all, or you want more time to talk about it? We should meet at this least week? have a yeah. meet this yeah. week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So meet this week on that one. Sub area planning. That one's still the one. There's no clear, exact proposal, so it needs more time. Yes, uh, EV and station. It's hard, hard to pinpoint who in planning can give right. us the correct answer. It seems like. It, it, and so I guess to back it up to our timelines, like we kind of. To Michelle's point, she needs to know exactly what to do right. with these, if it's going to go out to an RFP for a subcontract. So uh, maybe that one needs one more meeting to like nail down exactly what's going to happen, or it needs to get clawed back. Does that sound accurate? Sub area? We just need, yeah, we just need a final determination on mm -hmm. the West Central piece uh, and, and getting going on East Central. So one more meeting, probably, to have a definitive answer on that. Or, or an email, frankly. Yes, I think some of this could all be figured out by email. email. Yeah. Uh, youth behavioral health, that sounds like it just needs to be more discussion. More discussion, yeah. Here. Neighborhood business districts, we're waiting on that report, so we won't know really this week either. Multicultural centers, I didn't really hear a lot of objections. They're kind of waiting from council to say if we should bring that to study session or not. That's yeah. the next step is study session, look at the RFP, and then it goes out. So they're just looking for us to say, bring it to study session. Yes. Okay. It looks like there's so, general support yeah. for that. I think we have a good overview of where we're at Discussing. and got some time to nail down the details. So, so. I, it sounds like we need another week okay. before we can do a, a dot exercise because I don't know if we'll have answers by Thursday for several of these. I, we have... Um, no meeting next week, no Thursday meeting on April 4th. And then we have our joint budget meeting on the 11th. Do you want to look at tagging on the end of that, an ARPA dot exercise? Now, to be clear, we we're just that. talking about clawing back. Clawing we're back. not reallocating yeah. in right. this correct. one, correct? Okay. Correct. Yeah. So the claw back at that Definitely. meeting, and maybe just a quick update. So maybe after the budget meeting, a quick update from those groups to report back on where those landed. And then we would do a claw back exercise. And then that would give us the two more weeks to... Right. And then if we keep with our, our timeline of um, hearing from the mayor at finance on April 22nd and taking that full next week mm -hmm. to propose council member priorities for reallocation, and, that and still lines up. Yeah, I would say this is also an opportunity for council members to say if they had other priorities, too, that they thought ARPA money should be dedicated towards. And that just... 
Well, so then, we're, then we're getting into the reallocation, and that's, no, that's no, what no, I was no. just trying uh, to get. That's what I was saying at that meeting, not at the clawback activity. Oh, at on the, the 29th. Fall. That's still in April for converse, starting the conversation okay. on yeah. reallocation. Yeah. Um, at that, uh, if we do the clawback exercise at, after the joint budget meeting on April 11th, would you like to move that meeting to this location? We're going to be over at the library. Do you, any, you can give me that feedback offline on where, where you think that should take place. I would say that April 22nd would be the mayor's proposals, and if any other council members have proposals, yeah. bring it to that meeting too so that everyone has a week to think about it okay. beforehand. Okay. And I will circulate an updated version of this timeline to all council members and staff. Jacoby, do you have any uh, details uh, regarding that finance committee meeting on the 22nd? I mean, is the mayor, is it like, are we giving her the whole time? Is that the conversation? Are no, we giving 10 I, minutes? I, I, or? I wasn't thinking that. This, this came out of that uh, last ARPA work group conversation, and I, I don't even know that the mayor's team is fully briefed that okay. they're welcome to come and share at that So meeting. We'll, we'll talk about we then how talk to about that. allocate that time then. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else on this? If not, we'll do our reports real quick. Uh, okay. So first up, uh, council office ops. We meet this week. Um, we're meeting monthly at this point, and I've got a draft agenda for that meeting that includes a review of our council office budget, a review of the budget manager job position, and a discussion about our recruitment plan for that, continuing the conversation around LA2, and then I'll give that group an update on City Cable 5 efforts to get us live off-site, an update on our council considerations page, and an update on migrating committee minutes approval from committees to ledge sessions. Okay. So uh, we'll just quickly, we'll also be oh. looking at council travel. Tra council travel budget. Oh, travel. Okay. Uh, ARPA, I think we've kind of covered that. <laughs> uh, equity subcommittee. There's a meeting coming up. Really soon on my calendar, but I can't remember when. Okay. And it will be my first one. Okay. So nothing to report quite yet. Right. Uh, language access, there's a meeting tomorrow that is still moving. Legislative committee, ledge committee. And Eric, if you want to just go ahead and give your little two cents right now, that'd be fine. Probably <laughs> <laughs> Just a brief update, it's all we need. Grab Garrett before he left the room and defer all questions to him. But um, no, I just think your your ARPA discussion really hammers home how important our relationships are with the state and federal government. So um, I sent you all a memo of legislative outcomes from this past uh, state legislative session, and I've got another document I'm going to send you after this meeting with a lot of specifics. I don't know how deeply you want to get into that, but I would just say uh, generally another surprisingly banner legislative session just wrapped up, one where we had been warned to keep our expectations very low because of a, a very unusually small capital budget, uh, supplemental budget year where typically not a lot of new stuff is funded, a short session where a lot of policy initiatives typically don't pass. So, you know, typically we go into these sessions with very low expectations. And as always, it just feels like our local legislative delegation delivered in unexpected ways. And we've, we've just been so blessed to have just not our third district team representing the city, but the fourth and the sixth districts too. So a lot of great stuff came out of that. I would say that, uh, you know, the X factor for this session was really the collaboration between you, the council, and uh, the new mayor and her team. Um, things that materialized when several of you were there in person during the legislative session, council president, council members, along with the mayor's team. I think a lot of that stuff happened organically in the wings is what it sounds like, a $4 million <laughs> grant for the city to begin to decommission track and to move people to other shelters and warming centers. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, council president, but um, you know that came out of a one-off conversation in the wings with a couple of our legislators. And He says, I think I can get you $4 million. And I immediately left and called, hey, get me some to the legislature. They can get us $4 million, and they did. So yeah. thank you for them. 
It's awesome. I mean, it's, uh, you know, really affirms the adage, must be present to win. And I think the mayor being there, council members being there, all the staff, our lobbyists that, that work on the ledge team, it was just a great uh, work of teamwork that resulted in that. A um, million dollars for a new uh, street medicine pilot program, which is rapid response to help uh, deal with uh, people who are unhoused. Uh, new money for the Leita, uh Fire Station, which you, Council Member Dillon, helped lead the charge on. Thank you for that. Um, some some funding we didn't even ask for from the legislature to help deal with uh, carbon reduction at the waste energy plant uh, came through. So there were some nice surprises on the policy front. Uh, Council Member Zappone, your work on uh, hate crimes, along with you, Council Member Dillon, was just you know great breakthrough, big policy changes that we were able to achieve in a short session. So. Again, lots of uh, lots of highlights f for you. You know, having developed the legislative agenda in concert with the administration to to feel good about, good about and brag about going into next session, which we've already started preparing for. Essentially, you know, we'll begin forming uh, probably a more robust legislative session for next year. At our, we'll kick that off in our next legislative team meeting. We're also um, undertaking a much needed um, uh, update to our federal legislative agenda. We've been really, the city, you have been really focused on uh, earmark requests the past two years and we've had a lot of success there, but we haven't really uh, formulated a policy agenda to advance. So that's, that work is underway. I and our lobbyists and staff will be all around to meet with you and pick your brains about what your priorities are and how we can support you. And so, yeah, that's all just underway. And I can answer any questions Great. about what happened and what didn't happen if you have any, but. Any quick questions for Eric? And we can always do a longer, kind of more in-depth discussion too. Yeah. And just who's the new legislative team? I think we should make that known. The new legislative team. Yeah, so um, at the end of the legislative, so Council President Wilkerson has been uh, kind of the de facto leader of our ledge team and having built the legislative agenda going into this session, we thought it made sense for her to see that through until the end of session. But now I guess it's goodbye, farewell, we love you. And uh, you will be replaced ably by uh, Council Member Dillon and then uh, council members Zappone and Bingle remain uh, centerpieces of that group. And again, it's been just great teamwork. I expect nothing, you know, nothing less than that going forward, so. Yeah, thank, thank you for all your work. Yeah. You're amazing and you really help lead this effort. And also, thank you, Councilmember Bingle, for advocating for District 2, Leighton Fire Station 2. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, if there's nothing else for Eric, Eric, okay. thank you so much. Great, thank you. And one, one last thing on that, SB 6175 uh, got passed when they didn't think it was gonna get passed, and so that was a big one for us. And uh, unfortunately- the housing conversions mm -hmm. uh, bill, yeah. Just hoping our planners that just left the room would wanna brag about that. Great, great accomplishment. Absolutely. Sorry to interrupt too, but. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the, the money for the feasibility study for the carbon capture out at, uh, uh, the waste energy facility is dependent on whether or not uh, a vote goes the right way uh, or the way that the legislature wants it to go this year because it's uh, it doesn't we don't receive those monies unless the climate commitment act remains yeah yeah elections have consequences right we hear it every day so that's certainly true with some of our legislative ass okay Thank you for not Thank asking you. me about automated traffic cameras. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you all great. <laughs> and uh, Alex, I passed you over. I apologize. You want to come on up? And I'll just briefly mention the next one is the uh, investment committee. We did meet uh, as the first uh, investment committee meeting I had, and uh, we basically just went over portfolio objectives and the uh, 2023 results. And if anybody wants a copy of the, of the uh, PowerPoint, I can share that out. So if you want to go ahead, Alex. Yeah, good afternoon, Council. Um, really, I'll take any feedback on additional presentation items that you'd like me to bring next month. But I just wanted to highlight uh, 
three different things that I'm working on. One's uh, our language access. So um, I took our ordinance and really identified the documents and spaces where we need language access and shared it with the administration. But then I'm still working with uh, Jarrell and the administration to make sure that we are getting that program up and running and part of that uh, ARPA working group as well to make sure that we're getting something under contract uh, and kind of sharing some of that expertise there. Uh, our equity subcommittee, uh, you know, they want to meet one, uh, we received four new applications this past year or since January. Um, and it's been interesting on how those community members have found us. Uh, some have been trying to grow on equity or belonging work and, and Googled what's happening in Spokane and that's uh, how some have arrived to that space, uh, which is interesting. But uh, so that means we'll be bringing, uh, if the equity subcommittee votes them on, we'll be bringing those names up uh, to you. Uh, we're also working on a retreat to see how to be more effective and what are the issues that they really want to tackle a little bit more. They have uh, outlined procurement and stipends as uh, things that they want to talk about a little bit more, but then also how do we better engage with council, which brings me to a third program, which is community days, and that's how do we invite uh, nonprofits from multicultural groups to invite the members that they serve uh, before our council meetings. So that's like between 5 to 6.30 to either table, invite them, and that'll be an opportunity for us to also engage these various community groups, whether it's invite them to be boards and commissions and or share about how, our, how to read our council agenda uh, programs. And for that first one, we'll have, uh, we're partnering with various Latino organizations and we'll have an invite interpreters to kind of see how that's going to work um, during our council meetings. Um, so those are the quick items that I have. I know that we work uh, with various council members on different projects. If you want me to share about those projects in future meetings or, or if you want to share about them, that's totally up to you. Perfect. So, Any questions or comments for Alex? No. I look forward to the interpreter to see how that works in our chambers. That would yeah. be fascinating. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Uh, next up is SIRS. Uh, SIRS uh, met with um, the mayor and her team uh, in this last meeting. Um, they have some ideas on a, uh, on a, um, a new director um, outside of uh, the director that we have already approved. And so uh, we're, um, those conversations are moving forward. Uh, new allocation strategy could be could be going forward, um, and so we'll see. Um, I'm wanting, personally, I'm wanting SIRS to be as aggressive as possible with its investments, so where we can uh, uh, be making more money, getting a higher return. Because right now, employees are paying 11 and a quarter percent of their paycheck into their pension, and uh, if we're ever going to get that down below 10, 9, 8, you know, percent. Uh, you know the the unfunded liabilities gap has to has to really close, and so uh, we're working on a number of things there, uh, but overall going well. I think in my time we've expanded that a percent or a percent and a half, so it's going the other way. Yeah, we approved uh, one percent uh, last year, I believe. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Questions, comments. Okay. Uh, next up, aging and long-term care. So met with aging and long-term chair care. Excited to be the new vice chair. It just goes with the job. Um, they are expanding more in their programs and taking it out into the community. So, what a great partnership that we really have with them. We just haven't engaged them. So, I like to see us really have that conversation with our CHHS department of what, how are we connected going forward. So, pretty fascinating group. So, I'll have more next time. Okay, AWC. Hey, we just uh, came back from Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago, met with all of our electeds there, and I, when I left, I go, I wasn't hating on any other state, but I love the state of Washington, and I love Spokane, because really our problems are big, but they're not what are being faced by other cities across the country. So a lot of support for us in Spokane, and so that was good. Looking forward to taking more council members with me to the AWC conference in Vancouver in June. Okay. Uh, fire pension, I'll just say we approved uh, a number of claims 
and we got kind of our annual update uh, overview. I'm assuming it's very similar for police pension, mm -hmm. Council President. Yes, very okay. similar. Um, I'm the new the new rep on there. Yeah. And, oh, you uh, are. Okay. Just had an introductory meeting and um, setting up an audit. Perfect. Okay. Uh, police lodging tax advisory committee. Councilmember Zappone is online. Oh, is yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, uh, LTAC met last week for the first time. Uh, we had a good conversation about the ordinance that uh, has come to us before committee. They had a couple things they wanted to weigh in on, um, and then they were setting a priority of funding. There's about four hundred thousand dollars this year or built up to go out, and they're trying to focus on how do we spur new events rather than established events. So as long as the council agrees with that, I'll keep giving some direction to focus on trying to spur new events. Okay. And then, Council Member Zappone, are you also on the TPA commission? Yeah, that one only meets a couple times a year, so no update. Okay. Uh, U District. I'll let Mr. Wright speak to that. He's been going in my, uh, oh. in my stead. Um, yeah, I attended one meeting on behalf of uh, Council President. Um, of the um, Development Association, okay. uh, not the PDA. Um, and it was basically an overview of some of their development projects as well as their community investment uh, fund proposal. Okay. Uh, Council Member Zappone, visit Spokane. Hey, yeah, we're only meeting quarterly, so no new update then. Okay. Uh, West Plains PDA, is that Council President? Yes, we did not have a meeting last month as we were all in DC, so we'll be meeting next week. Okay, and the last one, any PDA, I'll just say we unfortunately did not get our, our capital allocation that we were hoping for from the legislature, uh, but we do believe that we will almost assuredly get it next year. We did get some, I think, planning dollars. Um, it, it delays us a little on the project, but not too significantly, so it, it kind of works out okay. Uh, but the other piece is we've added two new board members. We were without a full complement of our board for quite a while. And we did just uh, add uh, Shelly Sondren and uh, um, Rose from Avista. Melanie Rose. Melanie Rose from Avista. Uh, and so those are our two new uh, board members at the PDA. So anything from anybody else? Nope? Okay. Then we will call this a meeting and uh, adjourn and see everybody next month for more finance.